Welcome to Talking Business, the weekly digital business interview from Tees Business in association with Jackson's Law Firm. First of all, a word for our sponsors. Jackson's Law Firm have been advising business owners and individuals in the Northeast since 1876. And with offices in Stockton and in Newcastle, they are ideally placed to support the region's businesses with all aspects of commercial law. Now this week we're joined by another well-known face from the Tees region's business community. I'm delighted to be joined by the Managing Director of Tees Components and not only that, but the reigning Tees Businesswoman of the Year, Sharon Lane. Welcome Sharon for joining us today. Thank you, thanks for having me. Now Sharon, we're going to talk about a bit about your, uh, your business career and, uh, and about Tees Components. Um, Let's let's start for those who 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 don't know because you know these components you, you you're not right in the center of things you, you're you're a little bit out on a limb and yet you're uh, one of the longest established firms in the, this region so tell us a little bit about the, the history of these components. Yeah, these components is um, a subcontract mechanical engineering company. Um, we're family owned and family run. We've been established for um, 55 years now, and um, we're based in North Skelton in East Cleveland. Um, so as you say, not really in the heart of, um, of Teesside and maybe not, not so well known as others for that reason, based on, on a former ironstone mine site um, in, in a, you know, a relatively small village. So quite a rural location really. And what we're known for and what we specialize in is very large CNC machining. So we've been working um, throughout our history. CNC being what is CNC? Computer, computer numerical controlled um, machines. Okay. So when we first started out, we were um, a machine shop. We used to a jobbing shop really, and we used to look after um, British Steel, ICI, Cleveland Potash. You know, very much local work um, from that North Skelton site um, back in the 60s and 70s, and then over the years. Um, the business has grown. Um, we've kept investing. So we said goodbye to our last manual machine quite a few years ago. And since then, we've been a fully CNC shop. Um, that's apart from a, a couple of small machines that we use for the apprentices to teach them the manual skills still. And, um, and so we, we've really built up a reputation, particularly in power generation. And we work um, for clients all over the country. And then about 15 years ago, we also um, took on our own product, um, which is the Tees White Gill product, and that's a thruster for ships. So we supply those to ships all over the world. Uh, we've just done a project for the RRS Sir David Attenborough. So we, we fit them to research ships and military ships. Um, and we also service them all over the world as well. So two very different sides to the business. Um, CNC machining, which is um, for domestic um, UK clients, and then also a marine product we're an OEM for, and that we um, is predominantly export, and that we we travel worldwide. And this is a business that was, I believe, it's very much it remains a very much a family firm, and it was started by your parents. Well, it, it wasn't actually started by them. Um, it was started in 63 and dad um, came to the business in the late 70s um, and he, he gradually um, took, took over the company. Um, my father was, he went straight from school into an apprenticeship. He went on the tours at Head Wrightson's. So he was a machinist himself, machine shop engineer. And then he went into a sales role and then he um, came into the business on, on sales. Um, and came off the tools and went into a um, you know that that sort of different uh, job, and then gradually developed and worked his way up into managing director and now company chairman, not just of T's components but also of um, Dorma Machine and Engineering in South Bank. So my dad has really always been one of those um, textbook entrepreneurial figures, really very inspiring in terms of leaving school at fifteen, no qualifications. Yeah. Getting a skill, learning about something and then really having a lot of ambition, personal ambition, but also ambition for the business um, to keep reinvesting profits and to keep growing it. 
Fantastic. And he's been in the business now then more than 40 years. So that, that's an incredible story in itself, isn't it? And yeah. so, so your dad's Clive and your mum's Jean and your mum yes. has also been involved. Yes. Yeah. So, so mum's um, also a director of the business um, and she's been very supportive um, for, for Clive and for myself throughout, of course. Um, very involved. It is a very much a, a traditional family business, you know, with all of the things that, that go with that, really. Um, it's just that we've got 65 employees, which is just that size where you know everybody, you know, personally. And um, it's got that nice feel to it where you've got enough people to be hopefully flexible in terms of what you can offer to your clients and looking after them. But you've not got so many that you lose touch with, you know, who, who everybody is. And, and you don't, you know, you lose those employment relationships. Brilliant. Now, I know you're MD now, of course, Sharon. Tell us a little bit about your your own personal journey to that position because i know we, we spoke in the past for a tease business feature and i was having a read through parent for this meeting and uh, I, I noticed a quote that you gave me which was there was a time when i think i was the only one who thought i could do it i mean that that sounds like you've you know pe people people look up to uh, um those like yourself that are at the top sharon and think well must have absolute total self-confidence and yet that suggests it hasn't always been that way yeah i mean i um i went to run tees when i was 26 and um i went on the durham mba program when i was 24 i think i would have been and i remember having to really get a lot of references and persuade the business school at Durham University to take me on the MBA program because I just didn't have enough experience and I was just too young um, and they tended to look for people over 30 um, at the absolute youngest to go on that program so I, I kind of always pushed myself to do things very early I think um, and so really you know when I first went into the business obviously I was working alongside my, my dad with all his experience but for a general manager I was you know really really relatively young um, so I, I think that people would naturally think, well, what, you know, what does she know and why, why would she be able to do this job? Um, and I just always had that, um, I did always have that belief in myself, I think, that I could do it because I always wanted to do it. And I always loved, even when I was a child, you know, being on the site and being in the factory and um, learning about the company. And that's what I always wanted to do. And I had gone to university, of course, full time after college, like everybody did, you know, after my A-levels, dropped out of the university course because it just wasn't for me. Um, and I just I just wanted to work. I just wanted to get a job. Um, and that was really hard because I was the first person in my family to go to university um, to do a degree. And, um, you know, it was quite <laughs> disappointing, I think. It's interesting, Sharon, because I, actually I, I said that maybe you had self-doubt, but actually perhaps you had the opposite of that because when at the moment when everybody was perhaps doubting you, and I, listen, I know that you've touched on it before with me, that there, you, you, th you felt that whether it was true or not, you felt that there were some people that would be saying, well, she's only got there because of, uh, you know, who her uh, dad and mama yeah. are then, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and so therefore you've got to have a lot of uh, self confidence and uh, to, to to and perseverance to push forward from that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I've been incredibly lucky and privileged to be able to be in this position where you know I could go into the family business and I could um, get this experience and learn and do this job that that I love doing. Um, and I completely acknowledge that I've you know I've had that luck to be in that position, um, but. But certainly, I think being female in heavy engineering and then also being sort of relatively young, you know, there were lots of situations early on where clients or other visitors would come in to meet the MD or the general manager at the time and kind of look past me and over my shoulder to see where the, the man was, you know, or the older person was. Um, and that's something that you learn to, to deal with, really, when you're meeting people for the first time, is how you um get across really what your actual position is because it because you you don't you might not look like what people expect a general manager of an engineering company to look like especially um, yeah in an in, in engineering and it is you know a male dominated world yeah, um, yeah. i mean do, do you find that you have to work harder to get to win the respect of of I some don't, i don't now not at all now um but i certainly did then and i really um 
you know, I, I did work a lot harder. And I think most um, most women that I've spoken to in engineering feel like, you know, they, they definitely kind of really slogged at college or in their apprenticeships or whatever it was. Um, I mean, I was the biggest SWAT going when I was doing my HNC and then my engineering degree um, at Teesside. Um, you know, I used to just like stay in the classroom at lunchtime and stuff. I mean, it was, you know, it was embarrassing really, but I, I was never like that at school. Um, and like I say, I actually dropped out of university, but one, once it was for engineering, I suppose you feel like you've sort of got to prove something as well because you're not doing something that people expect you to do necessarily. And so, yeah, I think you definitely felt like um, you wanted to just do, do really well. You didn't want to scrape through anything. Um, did you get resistance um, for you going into you know, a, a career like engineering? I know no, that I you wouldn't have got it from your parents because I guess they yeah. were, were all for it, but um, the yeah. mothers? No, I don't think that I did. I, I don't think that um, anybody ever said to me that I couldn't do anything. I think it's, it's just that it's just a bit funny when you're the only one who's like you, really. Um, yeah. And that's the same. It could be because of your background. It could be because of your age, because of your sex, be, because of um, you might be black, ethnic minority. Whatever the reason is, if you're in a group of people at university or at work and you're the only one like you then you know you you do you do feel a bit set apart you know yeah and I mean because uh, I was because I, I was going to ask you about this so let's jump to this because your business journey really started didn't it with an apprenticeship at TTA um, yeah you, when you were one of only four women among 660 apprentices yes so there yeah. was 500 and 56 males, four <laughs> yeah, women. Like that. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what, what was that experience like? And it, does it make it harder, apart from making you work harder? I mean, does it make it tougher for you? I think the, the day-to-day stuff, obviously, you're all doing the same stuff. Um, and the, the girls, you know, we, we became good friends because we were, you know, we were put together and we had that in common, if you like. Uh, and it was really nice to work, to work alongside and study alongside them, those other girls. And I still, you know, have really fond memories of that, actually. Um, and they stayed in engineering, by the way, the others. Uh, the the one the one that I know of, yes. And I should really look up the other the other two. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just that. Um, Sorry, what was the question about? Um, it was really just about how tough you you found. What, what did you find it a, a challenge just being four among six hundred and sixty? Yeah, no, I, th- I think it was just different. I won't say that it was really difficult. Um, it was difficult doing an engineering apprenticeship for lots of reasons, but I think that's the you know that's what you we were treated doing. differently. Um, no, I don't think I was. I remember TTE as being very professional um having you know good relationships with their instructors and then being very professional and very uh, equitable in terms of how they treated everybody um yeah. that was great um and i know that I, I sometimes bump into people now and they say oh i was with you i was with you at tte <laughs> and you have no idea who they are, what they are because obviously when you when you're one of the girls everybody knows who the girls are so they all knew who i was but i couldn't remember who all of these different hundreds of boys were so sometimes that's a bit awkward now um, but no, I, I loved it. I really got a lot out of it. I really enjoyed it. Um, we got a chance to do things like we went on um, a work placement to France. We went and stayed with a French family with TTE and we went to work. They had like a partner training centre in Afropoise in northern France. And we went and worked there as well. And, um, you know, that we just had lots of opportunities with them. And I was really, really grateful for that, actually. Yeah. Well- now, I'd like to ask you a little bit about, and, and I'm assuming that you're a fan of apprenticeships, given that where, you, where it helped you give you your first runs on the ladder, but um, Paul Booth, um, you know, former chair of uh, uh, Tees Valley, came on here recently, and he, he was he's saying, look, not everybody agrees with me over this, but if we want to encourage more female apprentices, We've got to find ways of looking after them in a in a better way. And at the moment, if if you were only one, and he he made the example of he recently went to uh, he decided to lose some weight and he went along to a swimming club and he says I'm the only bloke there and he says and honestly, um, you, you become either the object of a little bit of ridicule or you know um you know or you get totally ignored because you yeah. don't have quite the same things in common. And he mm-hmm. says and that got me thinking just how tough it is to be you know the only female apprentice 
among many males and that made me think that maybe we should be thinking a different way that we have we need to have the female apprentices keep them together for whether it be camaraderie support you know a common goal mm. what, 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 but what have you i'd be interested in your views on that because paul said look not everybody agrees me with me on this no it's funny i have actually had this conversation with paul uh, and i do agree with him um because i it's for, like i said earlier i think if you're the only one like you for, for whatever reason you do just feel a bit apart from everybody else and um I mean, yeah, so I think that for me, having that small group of um, girls and young women at TTE definitely made the difference and having that, you know, um, that little bit of a group, that little bit of a, you know, and um, so, yeah, I, I would agree with them. I think I can see why it's controversial and there's a, a lot to be said for, you know, integration. And I know a lot of people feel like if you have a small number of a minority group, you ought to dot them around, you know, and split them all up. But no, I, I agree with them. I, you know, and I, I think mutual support and being able to just chat about whatever it is that, you know, is affecting you um, in your little minority group for whatever reason is, is really important. And again, I don't, I don't, don't just mean with regards um, to your gender with that, you know, I think, I think that's the same for any minority group, really. It's, it's your shared experiences, isn't it? Mm. Now, we've, we've slipped into this, the, the issues of agenda and we, without, of course, um, talking about the big ones. Last October, you were crowned T's Businesswoman of the Year. Um, so I'm just interested, obviously, it was uh, we, T's Business, uh, Martin Walker and I were proud to make that happen. And it was uh, an event that's grown from, I think, 270 were at our first event when Claire Preston became the first winner. You were our second winner. There was 440 there that night. Um, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd be looking forward to having 500 on there. But let's see where we get this year. Um, but, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, what, what did it mean to you to be T's Businesswoman of the Year? And, and what, what would you like to it to mean, ultimately? Um, it was just really, I mean, I, I think lots of women who... I've spoken to have sort of received these awards you're never really sure what you've actually won it for because you're you know you're doing your job I mean I just you know I have a clear idea in my head of what my job is um, and what my ambition for the business has been and that's what I've done so it's kind of what you know you don't really need an award for that really um, but I've really admired what you've done with the Business Women Awards just in terms of it um, providing lots of role models and highlighting women's achievements um, because there was a real dearth of, of you know um, examples of that previously um, and what it's done as I've mentioned to you before has created this brilliant network of um, business women in the region mm. who have then gone on and done a lot of good and I know you know if anybody ever says well what was the point in those awards it's not about getting glammed up and getting a you know a trophy and all of that is really nice it's about the legacy and the long-term impact that it can have um, on our girls and young women in the area so that you get that next generation coming through has your event done that you know definitely within two years you've already got you know really clear examples of things that otherwise just would not have happened so I, for me you know it's absolutely um fantastic what's been achieved myself as a, a, a winner or a nominee and another businesswoman we're, we're part of, of creating that effort really that's the way that that i see it um because we we do need those role models you know, we need we need mm. the male role models of showing how you can achieve. <coughs> and, and what do you say, Sharon, to those who you know there are doubters out there? And what mm. do you say to anyone who says, "Well, okay, um, I just want to be judged against everybody, not just against women." Well, the day we can do that, then you know, then we've won, really. Um, you know, there are lots of different award ceremonies for different groups of people in all different sectors you know through, throughout the country and throughout the world really and mm. the reason that you create those is, is to highlight achievements that otherwise would, would be unnoticed um, and and I think you know from your point of view when it started when you were asking people to say who their inspiring um, business leaders were and you weren't getting many female names whereas now when you run that exercise in your magazine you get lots and lots of female names and that's just because none of us knew that they were there we just didn't know who they were so um it's interesting isn't it it's it's there, there really is i don't think it's stereotyping but women 
the business successful business women in this region do appear to hide their light under a bushel more than um, many of their male counterparts. Is that, is I think, that yeah, I'm sure there are people who clever people who understand the you know all of the issues here. I, I don't really understand it, but I think you can certainly notice that that's it does seem to happen. Um, I think, as, as I've said to you before, I think it's really important that we showcase the strong role models um, for our boys and our girls, um, particularly stories where, you know, we've seen people come against adversity from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, you know, and, and I think it's really important that we, we make sure that our celebration of business leaders is, you know, across the board. And yes, you've kind of had to bring in these awards to highlight that. In an ideal world, you would never have had to do that. We're not in an ideal world. Um, but I think at some point, we'll, that's where we'll be. And it'll just be awards, and that would be great. Yeah. So I mean, I think you are living proof. It's fair to say you're living proof that you know, with the with the right chances and with the determination and the talent, you can reach the top, um, regardless of your gender. So, what what barriers do you think are still speaking generally? Here, what what barriers do you think are still there to that mean that fewer women get to the top? Than, than, than men? Um, I think it's about um, you can't be what you can't see. Um, you know, that's, um, that's a phrase that's being used a lot now as strap lines for a number of charities and organisations that are working with girls and young women. It is really important that these role models are seen, you know, that, that if you're growing up and you're considering not, not really even a particular career, but you're setting yourself your kind of ceiling of where you think you can get to in life that you can see women doing, you know, carrying out those roles. Um, some women will always get through without that, you know, but I think we would, we would have a lot more. Um, and that's why the work that you're doing is really valuable and, and the work that um, organisations such as Ruby's, the charity in Middlesbrough for girls, um, such as the Girls Network, the national organisation for uh, mentoring, you know, that, that's why it's important that we do that. Um, Red Car and Cleveland have a great scheme on Inspiring Women Day where they, um, you have a businesswoman have a girl to spend the day with them. Um, I had a young woman um, this year just spend the day with me. And um, When you, you know, say young girl, what was it, somebody from school? Or yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so Zainab, she came from um, a school in Middlesbrough. She was um, 15, 14, 15. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know if she, but what she thought. <laughs> I don't know if she had the greatest day in her life, I'm not sure, walking around the factory with me all day. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that she saw that um, it's doable. It's, it's an option open to her, you know. Yeah. And, um, and so there are some really great schemes around that people have been doing, again, quietly for years, ticking over, that provide those opportunities for girls to see. And, um, and I, think, I think that's really important. It's really important that they keep getting that message from schools and from careers advisors. Because you would think that that is all fine now and there's no more discrimination. But I, I think they still probably get some mixed messages as well. Um, you, th you still think there might be some stereotyping going up, going on? At yeah, school? I do, and I don't think that's anyone's fault. I think it's just that you know, it just just take a long time to change views, really. Um, mm -hmm. So the, yeah, the, the mentoring scheme. Uh, I think people. I mean, I know that you know. I think, as I understand it, it's dri it's driven by J uh, Professor Jane Turner at Teesside University, but yeah. she is you know on the back of on the back of the Business Women Awards as has um, really got together uh, a, an amazing group of female business leaders from the region and together you are trying to inspire and uh, motivate th the next generation of potential female business leaders. Is that is that a fair summary? Yes, yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so the Girls Network is a charity that's um, nationwide and it's been running for, for several years now but it currently doesn't have any presence in the Tees Valley. So what Jane wanted to do was to, because we were a group of women that were wanting to mentor girls, rather than start from scratch, she thought if we link with that network um, and ask them to start providing um, support in the Tees Valley region, so that's what we've done. So we've had a group of us already go through the training um, and we are waiting to be um, sort of matched up with our mentees. 
um, things are, you know delayed at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, and you give an hour um, a month for a year. You know, so it's a really just completely doable in terms of your time commitment. And you think, well, it's not really, you know, what will that do? But actually, you know, some of these girls otherwise will just not see women in, you know, doing these roles and women in these mm. positions. Mm. And as a mentor, you can signpost them, um, you know, and you can advise them and you can say, well, have you thought about this? Or I know you can use your contacts, you know, a massive thing with the girls network is about women having built up this huge network of um, business contacts in different professions is being able to then link up these girls um, because you kind of assume that they'll see their parents doing these jobs or they'll see their friends' parents doing these jobs. But <clears throat> for lots of the, these girls, they just, they don't see that, you know, yeah. and they just wouldn't have that contact any other way. It's really about um, raising their aspirations and, and opening their eyes to uh, the, the, possibility, yeah. the possibilities. Really. Mm, yeah. I can't wait to start doing it. Yeah. I, I just really am looking forward to it. Yeah. It, it sounds fabulous and we'll definitely follow it on very closely on T's business. Mm. Um, so turning back to T's components, let's talk about the challenges that, that, that re, um, are around because there are one or two at the minute. Um, <laughs> so if we can talk pre-COVID, first of all, um, because I know you, you, you personally led a move to diversify the business um, as traditional markets moved abroad. Um, and so tell us a little bit, li little bit about that, because I know that you've gone into upskilling staff and investments. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Tell us the story. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the um, the business was really um, it was well established in traditional power generation sectors. Um, and we were known for very large machining work. Um, but we just gradually were seeing um, th that work start to go overseas to low cost countries. Um, and it was, you know, it was a very slow effect, but it was clear that, you know, the traditional um, clients that we had um, wouldn't necessarily require our services in the future or had, had outsourced the work to low cost countries. I mean, for example, um, we used to do a lot of work refurbishing and providing new components for coal-fired power stations. So, you know, we obviously could see that one coming. Um, and we needed to really make sure that we were in a position to be able to um, move our services into those new sectors that were coming through. Um, and so we, we were already known for uh, very large, very heavy work. Um, we can lift up to 70 tonnes in our workshop. So that's, um, that's quite a niche um, area to be in really at that sort of size. But what we needed to do was really get across also the skill level that we had and the quality of the equipment that we had. And, um, and it became clear that really our business, because we've got such a fantastic loyal workforce, we've, we've had a very, very low staff turnover for a long time. And we train our own apprentices, which we carried on doing even when everybody else stopped doing that, when it became unpopular. Brilliant. Um, perhaps because of our physical location um, that we, we had to sort of train our own future personnel. So because we had that brilliant skill base as well, um, and we had such low turnover of, of our staff, we realized that we were really building up some significant product knowledge as well over the years. So somebody, a, a client had products with us. Um, over the years, we would really get to understand them and to, um, and to really know them in detail and to provide that consistency, perhaps more so than the client themselves, where the client might have left, you know, sort of their engineering personnel might have left over the years. So we really just tapped into that sort of longevity, um, that reliability and the skill level. So actually, yes, we can do very big things, but we can also do very complex things and very high risk things. And we started to apply that to products in the offshore wind sector, um, in the defence sector. When we've always done defence work, but we're doing a lot more now um, than we've ever done. And it was really about giving our clients and, and, and also just reassuring ourselves and giving ourselves the confidence that we could take that work on. Um, so the components that we handle now are very much the, the sort of one-off high-risk um, critical components um, that we kind of step up to the plate and you know we, we, we kind of are happy that we can carry out the, the engineering to, to be able to achieve all the different specifications that the client wants. And that's really where we've, we've placed ourselves now. Um, and and you've, moved into, you've moved into export as well, haven't you? So... We do. 
yeah because we took on our own product as well that sort of then just overnight put us into um into export because we acquired the product from another client so we already um so they already had a, an american um customer base that we we do everything with that and go through that learning curve um so yeah so we we export usually between half a million and a million pounds um a year um quite a lot to the us but worldwide is that growing um it just really depends on requirements because it's in the marine sector and it's it's particular types of ships as i said earlier so it's um defense oceanographic research ferries and it depends what their um workload is like and what their requirements are for their servicing um not doing anything at the moment um so everything's just building up until we can travel again well, yeah time. i was going to ask you i mean that that touches on the challenging times i mean we, we've had um We've had Brexit followed by COVID, um, and Brexit still dragging on, and COVID still dragging on. And so, what 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 are the implications of of? I mean, I don't. I suppose almost you can't have one without the other, but they both they both got their own um, pulls in different directions at the moment. What 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 are your thoughts on the impact they're having on on T's component? Well, luckily, we um, we haven't really seen any, any adverse effects so far. We've we've got a really strong order book at the moment, but again, quite a lot of defence work. Um, we can't carry out the overseas work at the moment, but we we know that that will be still required, so it, it's on hold for now. Um, we we are just hoping really that some of the major infrastructure projects that have been banded about um, go ahead, and that that then. You know triggers um future projects for our clients um in the longer term uh but we've we've won some new orders for the end of 2020 and into 2021 which has given us some really nice you know relatively long-term um, stability that we can work around um and because we work across a number of sectors um as i say at the moment touch wood we uh you know we, we're quite happy with how we're operating currently still slightly reduced capacity um but it's you're yeah, working to fulfill um orders still again in renewables so quite a lot of hydropower work that we're carrying out um and oil and gas obviously is is gone very quiet currently but you know we have to we have to hope that that won't be too long before that bounces back so overall you got you got a positive feeling about you know the despite the challenges a positive feeling about the the future we're always positive we always stay positive um yeah i mean there's lots of there's lots of good things coming out of the current situation and we're focusing on those um and the um yeah certainly some of the projects that we're involved in just now um you know we're still doing quite a lot of prototype development so still getting quite a few requirements where people are carrying out r&d work and you know needing sort of quite specific expertise on how things can be machined and how they can be manufactured and, and giving them that feedback. Um, and, you know, we feel like we've got into a nice sort of niche position of being able to do that really. So I hope that those kinds of services will be required, you know, really regardless um, as people continue to look at, at new products. And, and to be fair, government are, you know, they are providing plenty of support and the government are doing a lot and i think the other reason to be positive is that you know if more than anybody else this region knows how to come through a crisis doesn't it <laughs> yeah and we've got some really strong you know local leaders um and we work regularly with lots of different companies across teesside with a really nice um collaborative supply chain here um and that makes things a lot easier because if you've got a requirement from a client you just you know you don't have to look very far to find other subcontractors and suppliers to partner with to be able to go back to your clients actually i can get all of this done you know there's not going to be a lot of transport travel time or anything um because we just you know we just have lots of those specialist you know actually world leading at what they do companies um on our doorstep so yeah i'm i'm confident about this year um and I, I think you know beyond into next year, it's it's quite it's quite difficult to tell currently how many opportunities we'll have from the reshoring that we're seeing now, but we're certainly starting to see some of that work already come back to us that you know that we'd previously lost overseas. So let's hope that continues.
Well, I think we're, we're all we're all keeping our fingers crossed on um, for for everything, and uh, the mm. the future is going to be challenging. But I think uh, we've got the resilience more than most areas to uh, to come through this. Um, mm. Sharon, thanks for joining us on uh, Talking Business this week. That's unfortunately all we have time for. Um, so really appreciate you giving us some insight into your your career and the, 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 your, your challenges at, at these components as well. Um, thanks again to our sponsors, Jackson's Law Firm, uh, supporting uh, for supporting Tees Business in this venture. Uh, they've been advising business owners in, and individuals in the Northeast for um, whoa, 150 years almost, since 1876. We'll be back again for more Talk in Business next week when our special guest will be Charles Clinkard. So we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, from myself, Dave Allen, from my business partner, Martin Walker, and all at Tees Business, stay safe, stay positive, and do keep talking up Teesside.